Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm Regina Burba, and I'm the chair of the session, this workshop on antimicrobial stewardship. First off, I'd like to thank the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Disease, as well as the Society of Healthcare and Epidemiology in America for um, considering to include this workshop in, the, in this grand convention. So the session objectives are, number one, to discuss the importance of antimicrobial stewardship as part of the solution to the threats of antimicrobial resistance. Number two, to review the achievement of antimicrobial stewardship in the Philippines. Number three, to describe challenges which confront the current program. Number four, to discuss how we can overcome the recent challenges to AMS. And number five, to give an overview on moving forward. So I'd like to, I'm the first speaker. So I'd like to share with you my slides. Okay. And uh, start off with, to respond to some of the objectives I've just described. So antimicrobial stewardship in the Philippines. These are my disclosures. I don't have any conflicts of interest. And I'd like to just for the next 15 minutes or so discuss where the Philippine AMS is now, what the AMS has achieved so far, our new national antimicrobial plan, and the new WHO AMS toolkit. And where do we want to go from here? So AMR or antimicrobial resistance is when microorganisms which cause infection can actually survive to a medicine that would normally kill them or stop their growth. Kumbaga, it's when medicines don't work anymore. And there are many reasons behind that. Uh, our our fight against AMR started off maybe around 2015 formally as a country when the Philippine president, Noy Noy Aquino, actually put out an administrative order that put together an interagency committee on AMR. And since then, it's been a journey together fighting this big menace that threatens to erase the uh, advances of modern medicine. So soon enough, after the 2015 administrative order came out, we put together a national action plan, and this is called the NAP on AMR. And it included several key strategies, which we tried to achieve from 2015 to 2017. And identified and addressed the drivers of AMR. So that by 2018, we were already able to have a review of the implementation of the initial NAP and describe some of the key achievements. Some of these are listed here, and the most important probably are, number one, the no prescription, no dispensing policy. This is when you're now unable to buy any medicine or antibiotic without the prescription. Number two, this is ensuring financial access to, anti to funding or support for antimicrobials. Of course, antimicrobial stewardship, which I will discuss more later. The development of national antibiotic guidelines was very critical in the success of the first NAP and the release of the national policy on infection prevention and control for health facilities. So after this big achievements for the first national action plan, the Department of Health along with the stakeholders were able to put together now a second national action plan that's supposed to run from last year, 2019 to 2023. 
The vision and mission of the new Philippine National Action Plan is as follows, that someday we will see a nation protected against the threats of AMR and implement an integrated and comprehensive program to address this AMR. The key strategies were more solid. There were more plans for it, as well as budget and financing, so that we're able to better address and meet the indicators that were set. There were more clear target indicators so that we try to achieve a reduction, significant reduction in the amount and burden of multidrug resistant organisms, not only in human health, but also in animal health. And in the second map, I think what's very important is that we realize that uh, antibiotic use is not limited to human health alone, so that there was now a broader framework that included other AMR determinants, including animal health. And now we're part of a bigger One Health approach, which tries to integrate strategies that include human health, animal health, and environmental health, as well as other partners. So the plan now is more comprehensive and more one society. So now our uh, many of the infographics that come out would be more comprehensive, including again, human health and animal health, and as, as also care for the environment. But uh, we need to understand that because our forum, are, we're mostly doctors. So I'll be more emphasizing uh, the threats of AMR to human health. And uh, indicated earlier was that one of the key achievements of the first NAP was actually this very successful rollout of the antimicrobial stewardship program across many hospitals in the country. So from 2015, we started off from the ICOM, ICOM R summit and uh, launched an initial pilot training of the first 16 hospitals. Soon, this expanded to over 500 hospitals now of level three and level two facilities across the Philippines. So that very boldly, we again plan to further incorporate level one, the huge number of hospitals included in the level one facilities. And supposedly this year, uh, include all sectors in our society. So we see now AMS or antimicrobial stewardship as a very clear solution to our problems on AMR. Especially so that more and more evidence show that the biggest drivers are really misuse or overuse in humans and in animals that feed on this AMR problem. So it's very, very important that we try to train everyone and make everybody commit to using antibiotics more appropriately and more safely from this point on, and that we use them only when needed to treat disease and choose the right antibiotics ad and administer them in the right way in every prescription that we write. So we always ask, is this the right antibiotic? Are we giving it in the right dose, in the right route, and in the right duration? And every year and after every training, we hope that every prescription in time will be yes to all the questions and there will be no wrong prescription. So this is what we mean by commitment to antimicrobial stewardship. Always, every time, every prescription. So um, technically, antimicrobial stewardship is the concerted implementation of systematic multidisciplinary and multi-pronged interventions to ensure appropriate use of antimicrobials. And that's really to create better outcomes for our patient and reduce the risk for the emergence of more AMR. It's always easy to discuss this in 
lectures like this, but when you're in front of the patient, it's always difficult to make this decision about balancing providing timely and appropriate empirical antimicrobial therapy versus reducing unnecessary use. And this is what we try to train users of antibiotics to always make the best judgment. So these are the objectives of AMS. Again, to uh, improve patient outcomes, reduce adverse events, reduce costs, and reduce development of AMR. We've uh, successfully trained level three and level two facilities. And as I said, level one facilities were already in our plan, except some things happened along the way. Uh, we couldn't have done this without the training hubs. And these are these hospitals plus more in the recent uh, months. And this is what's taught during this AMS training workshops. So there are core elements, one to six, and we spend time with the AMS teams to teach them this six core elements over usually a three to four day period. Who are the members of the AMS teams? Uh, there are more members in bigger hospitals, like in level three, there's a doctor or doctors, nurse or nurses, pharmacists, microbiologists, and IT personnel. And in smaller hospitals, there may be smaller AMS teams. So the recent challenges. Um, more recently, there's been more problems with budget and human resources. When we train hospitals in a few months or a few years, the AMS teams would change and we need to train them again. So that while we had very good plans, there were some problems that we met along the way. And actually we weren't successful in rolling out the 2019 initial plans of training level one facilities. And come 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic, we met another challenge. So the recent challenges have been very difficult to overcome. So the other thing I'd like to just uh, update you with is uh, very fortunately for us, there's the WHO practical toolkit that came out and it's called AMS programs in healthcare facilities in low and middle income countries. And it's not very different with a lot of updates, but not significantly different from what we have right now and what we've trained many hospitals with. The new things there are just some tweaking of the major strategic objectives and it's written here. So there are more programs that were introduced by the WHO more recently, particularly in infection control, in surveillance, and in risk communications. Um, the WHO toolkit also introduced these three pillars. So we're, there's now this triumvirate that will make or break us towards meeting and conquering the threat of AMR. The three pillars include, of course, antimicrobial stewardship, but it, there's also the need for surveillance and monitoring of the use of antimicrobials and the selection of antimicrobials in a, in a new acronym called AWARE. Okay, so what's AWARE? AWARE is a new classification of the WHO for essential medicines to guide antimicrobial stewardship. And the A is the access group. These are the first choice, first or second choice empiric treatment for most of the infections we see still susceptible to pathogens while showing lower resistance potential. This access group should be widely available in most of the healthcare facilities and people should have access to them. The WA of the AWARE is the watch group. These are first or second choice empiric treatments for a limited number of specific infectious syndromes with higher resistance potential. And there's a need to monitor this watch group. 
And of course, the RESERVE, that's the RE of the AWARE acronym. And these are treatment for confirmed or suspected MDR organisms. And we call them restricted. We need to protect them and prioritize them. And we really need to monitor and, uh, and report their utilization very closely. So the RESERVE group, um, they're very familiar with them. They include the carbapenems and the uh, cholestine, phosphomycin, linesolate, and the polymyxins. So when we started off the AMR and the AMS, uh, initially it was mostly Department of Health. And then um, we started to include and the professional societies very willingly participated. So the professional ID societies and other medical societies actually are very uh, keen parts and advocates of antimicrobial stewardship. And we've also included all the hospitals required, you know, all the hospitals in the Philippines and many of the medical schools. And now AMS partners and stakeholders continue to grow and we've expanded outside the Philippines. We now have included also uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine as part of our partnership. And we're very happy that the Society of Healthcare in America also uh, um, agreed to be part of our AMS uh, advocacy. So let's go back to drug-resistant infections and the threat of AMR. It's very important that we realize there's no time to wait. The COVID-19 cannot uh, stop us. We need to keep on fighting against them and preventing them despite and in spite of the COVID pandemic. And in time, each one of us will really have to be engaged in the fight against AMR regardless of what specialty and subspecialty we belong to, whether and what kind of profession we actually practice. So we can do that through antimicrobial stewardship. So that's it for my part right now. Up next will be the lecture on antimicrobial stewardship and COVID-19. Um, let me introduce our next ex esteemed speaker. She's one of our uh, most sought colleagues in infectious disease and a really staunch advocate of uh, antimicrobial stewardship. She's the chair of, infection, of the Infection Control Committee at the Medical City. She's also clinical associate professor at the UPPGH and our consultant at the Medical City. She's, uh, she's a very prolific researcher and a research collaborator and assistant professor at the Mayo Clinic in the United States. Let's all please welcome Dr. Sibel Lara Abad. Thank you so much, Ma'am Nina, for that kind introduction. Let me just share my slides. Good morning, everyone. I was asked to do an encore of a similar talk I did during World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. So today we will be discussing stewardship in the hospital during a pandemic, discussing some challenges and some solutions. I have no relevant financial disclosures. And as you all know, this uh, little guy over here or big guy over here, SARS-CoV-2, has really taken front and center during 2020. And everything we do seems to revolve around this virus. But in its shadows are really a lot of COVID-19 consequences, some of which Dr. Burba discussed earlier. And the consequences are far reaching, uh, includes uh, decreasing vaccination rates, for example, or having difficulty getting our patients with chronic illnesses such as HIV or cancer patients back to the clinic. But for the purposes of this discussion, we will discuss some COVID-19 consequences related to stewardship and antimicrobial resistance. 
As mentioned earlier, the goals really of stewardship are based on patient outcomes. So we want our patient to do very well, be cured of their illness, have very low morbidity and mortality rates, be safe by reducing drug consumption, thereby also decreasing resistance and healthcare costs. Now, unfortunately with COVID-19, it is a novel virus uh, and it just uh, made the appearance this year in our country. We really didn't know how to handle and how to approach patient outcomes because we didn't have a lot of medications in our pocket to use against COVID-19. So we decided to borrow all these other medications from the different diseases that we already have. So malaria, we borrowed chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. We borrowed azithromycin from CAP, lopinavir from HIV, interferon from hepatitis C. And lo and behold, many months later, we uh, actually ended up just using corticosteroids and perhaps remdesivir. Even though we know it's a virus, we also continue to use antibiotic therapy. So we haven't really reduced our consumption of antibiotics for SARS-CoV-2. So this remains as the big C or the big COVID challenge. We have to ask ourselves, as mentioned earlier, are antibiotics truly necessary for this virus? Based on published reports, about three fourths or 72% of patients receive antibiotic therapy, despite only 7% having a documented bacterial co-infection. So why do we do this? Why do we give antibiotic therapy for a virus? Perhaps I think it stems from our uh, experience with influenza, right? So with influenza, there were higher rates of co-infection. If you look at this meta-analysis over here, it ranged from as low as 2% to as high as 65% in some studies. So perhaps because of that, we wanted to uh, be a step ahead of the virus and give antibiotic therapy. But now that we have a lot more data on COVID-19 itself, if you look at the co-infection numbers over here, you look at the co-infection numbers are very low. And these higher numbers down here are really reflective not of community acquired co-infection, but hospital acquired infection. And we'll talk about that later on. If you look at this large retrospective study out of Spain, so of almost a thousand patients, the community acquired co-infection is really very uncommon, occurring only in 3% of their patients. And if you tease out these number 30 over here, 21 of them did have a concomitant community acquired infection, mainly streptococcal pneumoniae and staph aureus. Seven of them had a concurrent UTI and two of them had unusual organism because of underlying bronchiectasis. Nevertheless, the take home point here is that co-infection rates are very low. It's really just three to 7%. But let me give you a typical case scenario. Someone that sounds very familiar to all of you maybe, a 54-year-old female with hypertension and maybe diabetes admitted for worsening dyspnea. Chest x-ray shows bilateral pneumonia and she has low oxygen on room air. She's febrile. Her SARS-CoV-2 and her sputum culture are pending. But look at her white count is normal. Her procalcitonin is low. So we start her on dexamethasone, which is considered standard of care now for those requiring oxygen. And here we go. She started on an empiric antibiotic, typically piperacillin so what makes us decide on when or what to start a patient on? So typically it's many factors, right? So as clinicians, we look at the clinical status of the patient, but we also look at other data points. So we look at microbiologic data, radiographic data, and serologic data as well. So let me show you a snapshot of the first 200 patients in a tertiary level designated government hospital here in, uh, in the country. The caveat being that this is very early in the pandemic, so things have probably changed since then. But if you look at their severity of illness and you look at these descriptions over here, you find that antibiotics are given uh, pretty much to everybody who has severe to critical illness. So the sicker you are, the more likely you are to receive an antibiotic. And that's okay because these patients are very sick. If you look at their procalcitonin and white counts, you see that their normal range actually with mild to moderate illness and start to increase with severe to critical illness. If you look down here at the sputum results, you find that giving sputum or getting sputum is rather problematic. Only about 40 to 50% are able to provide sputum at the onset. And of these, only a small number actually grow bacteria and the rest are, are no, no growth or normal respiratory flora. If you look at the antibiotic choices, you find that we run the ABCs of antibiotics, literally. So we give azithromycin, beta-lactam in the form of piperacillin often, cephalosporin, typically ceftriaxone, and carbapenem. 
Now, thankfully, the carbapenem is typically reserved, as mentioned earlier, for severe to critical illness. So key finding for this snapshot here is that about 60% of patients are started on antimicrobial, despite only 13% having any growth and culture. And as expected, the sicker the patient, the higher the likelihood of starting antimicrobials. So what can help us kind of decide or tell us to be more level-headed and not uh, proceed with the knee-jerk reflex to start antibiotics right away? So it boils down to going back to the action plans that Mam Nina mentioned earlier, right? These are all in place for most hospitals with the exception of the audit and feedback plan, which should be in place by 2022, okay? So this is a four facet action plan. And unfortunately, these action plans were also reset by COVID-19, especially earlier on. So in the hospital that I worked in, for example, we were unable to educate a lot of the healthcare workers or the nurses that we pulled from different parts of the hospital to man the COVID units. So many of them were not used to handling very, handling very sick patients, right? Many of them were just uh, used to uh, used to working in the outpatient setting in wellness centers, for example. And here they are, here we are asking them to work in COVID-19 uh, special care units. We were also forced to pull our pharmacists who actually provide a lot of written audit and feedback and suggestions in terms of de-escalation and streamlining of antibiotic therapy. So we had to remove them from the wards, from their rounds, because it was unsafe for them. And so in essence, we were only left with this in place, which was carried out by infectious disease consultants and fellows as well. So as a result, as a consequence of um, the de derailing of these AMS action plans, we started to see an increase in antibiotic consumption and an increase in resistance numbers. And I'll show you some slides. So this is the daily defined dose, which is an estimate of how to calculate roughly the antibiotic consumption of a hospital or a ward, for example. So this is the DDD of ceftriaxone. And if you compare it to 2019, which is in the blue bar, and 2020, which is in the red bar, focusing on March and April, really the first peak of the pandemic here, you find that we doubled the use of ceftriaxone compared to last year. This worrisome trend is reflected also in the use of piperacillin and tazobactam. Again, higher bars for this year. And uh, unfortunately, also reflected in the use of meropenem. So again, we doubled the use of meropenem. And this is very worrisome because we're dealing with a virus, really, and not really a bacteria. So as a consequence of this increased drug use and other factors as well, we are now starting to see or starting to count increased numbers of our MDRO. So if you focus over here in our ICU areas, both COVID and non-COVID, and you look at ABAO, for example, comparing 2019 to 2020, we now have 23 patients with MDR ABAO compared to just 12 a year ago. If you look at the numbers of MDR KPN or club shell pneumonia, you find that we already have nine compared to just eight a year ago. And the other multidrug resistant gram negative organisms are also getting up there. So stenotrophomonas and pseudomonas. Thankfully, our MRSA rates have been below what it was last year. So what can we do? Uh, do we just give up? Uh, we can't give up, as mentioned, and we shouldn't give up. We just have to go back to the basics and not neglect the basic antimicrobial stewardship principles. These are the WHO's five measures of stewardship in the face of a pandemic. And of these, the first three are probably relevant to the hospital setting. So we have to increase clinical competence among healthcare, work, healthcare workers through targeted training and education. We have to con ensure the continuity of essential health services and drug supply. We have to reduce the turnaround time of COVID-19 testing and other tests so we can figure out if there's a concomitant bacterial pneumonia. So going back also, you have to reboot and restart these action plans that were derailed in the beginning of the year. Now that we have a little bit time to breathe, we can kind of reset these action plans. So going back to educating, I think we have to send the same message in the ER, especially in the outpatient setting, where there's a lot of prescription writing going on. So we have to teach our co-providers, you know, family practitioners, um, internal internists, for example, that there's no such thing as a COVID-19 treatment package, let alone a package that includes antibiotic therapy. And why do I say that? So based on the PSMID guidelines, if you look at this algorithm here, 
and this is for confirmed and probable COVID-19 cases. For mild uh, COVID-19 stated here in no uncertain terms, antibiotics are not needed. For moderate to severe and critical cases, as you walk through the algorithm, you'll notice that antibiotics do not make an appearance, meaning they are not mandatory. They're really case-to-case -case basis. So what will you answer to a patient that asks you, what can I take for COVID-19? So you have to teach them as well and tell them, you know, for non-severe COVID-19, the recommendation is really to provide supportive care. Meaning if you have body aches, you're given something for body aches, something for cough, if you have a cough. And if you have fever, it's an antipyretic, not really an antibiotic. So for severe cases of COVID-19, you will still get usual supportive care, this time with the addition perhaps of steroids, because we have um, very good data now to support the use of steroids in those patients requiring oxygen. Also for severe COVID-19, you will not be faulted for starting empiric antibiotic therapy, uh, but you have to reassess regularly the necessity uh, of these antibiotics and monitor them for possible side effects. If you should start antibiotic therapy, also take note that short courses are probably better than longer courses, and you can do an early intravenous to oral switch, right? So as a reminder, community-acquired pneumonia and hospital-acquired pneumonia are typically treated now for a week rather than 14 days, unless you isolate a specific organism such as Pseudomonas. These drugs over here have very good oral bioavailability, so you can probably do an early switch from IV to oral. This will make your nurses very happy. It will give them less stress so they don't have to go in and out of the room. And it will make the infection control team happy because it will decrease the risk for Lyme infections. You should also do culture-based testing up front before you start antibiotics because you want to maximize the likelihood of identifying a pathogen. So you want to pursue the diagnosis of that concomitant bacterial pneumonia. And if you don't see any, then you can de-escalate or if you see something, then you can escalate if you isolate an unusual organism. So let's go back to the typical case scenario. So you have that 54-year-old female with hypertension. She's now intubated, so she's worse. And her procalcitonin is higher at 10. She is SARS-CoV-2 positive, as you expected, but her sputum culture is normal. So what do you do with her piperacillin in most cases that I've seen, this antibiotic will be carried to completion, despite the negative culture. Okay. Now, let me show you this snapshot of these 24 patients who have negative cultures in normal or normal respiratory flora. And these are their severity of illness from moderate to critical. All of them completed their antibiotic therapy, regardless of their culture negative status. The saving grace probably is that the duration of antibiotic therapy was quite short mean of 4.5 to 8.5 days. But I wanted to focus on this because it really is the opportunity to practice AMS, right? So remember, no one will fault you for starting an antibiotic, but you have to reassess the need for that antibiotic. And then if cultures are negative, you should consider, can we discontinue it or maybe de-escalate? Now this patient is very sick, right? She was intubated, but her culture is negative. Or if you start something IV, then perhaps you can shift to oral uh, sooner rather than later. The problematic group of patients really are those who are unable to provide sputum. Now, what do you do with these patients? So for those patients who have no sputum sample, you really want to be a little bit aggressive in terms of trying to make the diagnosis of a concomitant bacterial infection. So you can do PCR-based tests or film arrays, which are available in the bigger hospitals, but these are quite expensive. So you can do cheaper tests. So you can do urine streptococcal or legionella antigens, right? And don't forget about your PCP-PCR because this can also manifest as a bilateral pneumonia. So we've had some close calls where we forgot to think about PCP and the patient ended up having PCP rather than COVID-19. Now, if you don't have these, then you can fall back on your surrogate markers. Now, go look at the Procal again. Is it high or low? Go look at your white blood cell count. Now I put in the fever and the CRP in parentheses because CRP tends to be elevated with severe COVID-19, so it's not very helpful. And fever is also not very helpful because your COVID-19 patient, especially the sicker ones, tend to be febrile for about two weeks or longer. So you can't expect them to defer best with the COVID-19. So going back to procalcitonin, uh, this can be very useful in terms of reducing antimicrobial use. 
But remember that high levels may actually occur in advanced stages of COVID-19 without a concomitant bacterial infection. So this is, I think, what happened to our example. We never were able to isolate a bacteria and she actually did very well. So I think her negative sputum culture is because uh, she just had uh, very bad COVID-19 and her elevated procal reflected this. So this is a nice study where they use procalcitonin guidance to guide their antibiotic use. This bar over here separates the low procalcitonin from the high procalcitonin. And if you look at the average defined daily dose of antibiotics for the low procalcitonin group, you see that the yellow bars are shorter than the bars over here. If you look at the average meropenem defined daily dose, you can see that meropenem use was actually much less uh, for those patients with low procalcitonin compared to those with higher procalcitonin over here to the right. So that's very good uh, use of procalcitonin. So one other reason to avoid using a lot of antibiotics up front is the potential for hospital-acquired infections down the line. Published data will show that hospital-acquired infection rates range from about 14 to 16 percent. And in the hospitals where I work, you find that the range for HAP and VAP are actually right on, so 13 to 16.5 percent. Fortunately, we have very low catheter-associated UTI infections. We do have a problem with our catheter-related bloodstream infections, especially in the private hospital. So there's some work for us to do in terms of our CRIBC rates. So how do we put it all together? So this is a nice algorithm from Dr. Whaley and his group. If you have a very sick patient admitted to the ICU and the patient is in septic shock or has a focal infiltrate, then yes, why don't you initiate antibiotic therapy and do some microbiologic sampling, and then you would treat as CAP or HAP according to guidelines. But remember to treat a short time and consider the escalation. If your ICU patient does not present in septic shock and does not have a focal infiltrate, then you can just do watchful waiting and just do your diagnostics, consider serial procalcitonin, rapid diagnostics, cultures, and then decide whether antibiotics are needed. So I also did or proposed an algorithm for all COVID-19 comers. So for mild illness, uh, with COVID-19 alone, no question, no antibiotics are needed. Okay, so there should be no prescription for cephalexin, nothing for azithromycin, clindamycin, et cetera. For those with moderate illness, so these are patients who are typically admitted but do not, have, do not require oxygen, but have pneumonia on x-ray, you would do a little bit of a workup, right? And then I also advocate no antibiotics be used up front but you can leave parameters for starting antibiotic therapy. You can always change your mind later on. For those with severe critical illness, you would do a more thorough workup, right? Because these are the sicker patients. Then you would probably give them some corticosteroids, plus minus remdesivir, depending on what criteria they meet. Uh, but again, you would still consider antibiotics, but just consider. It's not mandatory to start antibiotics, but no one will fault you for starting antibiotics because these are very sick patients. So then remember to de-escalate or discontinue when warranted. So the most important part of this algorithm are these two in the right side of your screen. So always leave parameters for starting and stopping and always remember to de-escalate or discontinue antibiotic therapy when no longer needed. So to summarize some take home points, COVID-19 or this pandemic is no exception to stop practicing AMS principles. Co-infection rates are very low and range from three to 7%. Antibiotics should be preserved for severely ill patients and for potential hospital-acquired infections down the line. We always use or should use different parameters to decide antibiotic therapy, so clinical, radiographic, laboratory parameters. Always remember that procalcitonin may increase with COVID-19 alone, so by itself it's not very helpful, so always use other parameters with it. If you do start an antibiotic, always remember to de-escalate, assess daily whether it's still needed, discontinue when you can, switch to oral earlier, and do short courses of therapy. And to take a leaf out of Dr. Lansang's playbook, I think we should all be gold. We should all be guardian of these limited drugs. Thank you very much. Thank you for these people who helped me uh, collect the data and stay safe, everybody. Hello. Okay. 
Okay. Parang we need to uh, breathe a little bit. That was uh, really a lot of information from the extensive lecture of Dr. Abad. But you would see that um, despite and in spite of the COVID pandemic, we really need to keep on, I'm sorry, to keep on uh, working towards uh, antimicrobial stewardship and keeping the program in place. Otherwise, we'll have more and more of the possibility of the development of multidrug resistant organisms, as well as maybe some increase in the healthcare associated infections. So let me move on to another part of the, um, as I said, when I ended with the first lecture, that there were many challenges to how we are actually able to practice antimicrobial stewardship at this point. So I entitled this particular mini lecture, Continuing Saga of AMS Challenges. So we know that uh, we've been trying to reach all the hospitals. We got sort of stuck with level one. We weren't able to pursue that. But uh, there are plans to, especially now during the COVID pandemic, it's really impossible to have the type of training that we've been doing since 2016. And very fortunately, the Department of Health already started to engage um, and subcontract the work so that we're now moving towards also virtual online trainings related to antimicrobial stewardship. So that's something to look out for. And um, as we pointed out earlier, it's very, very important that we really regulate and promote the rational use of antimicrobials to be able to fully implement the guidelines, maybe update the guidelines. That's one of the things we also probably should be doing during this COVID pandemic as things, uh, as Dr. Abad said, things sort of have changed a little bit. So um, monitoring and evaluation of the AMS programs are very, very important because this is the only way we could move forward. After training, some of the hospitals have been trained for something like two years, three years. We don't really know how people are doing right now and what people are doing at this point. So monitoring and evaluation are part and parcel of AMS and also a way to go to be able to fight AMR. So this, uh, many of you would ask, uh, do AMS programs really have any impact on patient outcomes? So there's this very good meta-analysis that shows us when put together that hospital-based AMS programs actually do work. They do have some benefits. For example, here, um, this forest plot of uh, many studies show that antimicrobial stewardship program in these hospitals can significantly reduce restricted antibiotic use by as much as 25%. And there's also significant reduction in the overall antibiotic use by 20%. Um, the impact is even larger or the difference is even bigger when you look at the use of antimicrobials in the ICU setting. On patient outcomes, it has been seen in this uh, systematic review that AMS can significantly reduce length of stay. And because we're able to reduce that length of stay, we're also able to reduce significantly the cost of hospitalization. So if there's still any doubt in your mind, then Uh, this is another um, meta-analysis by the group of Sh Dr. Schutz that tell us that uh, different, because different hospitals and different settings do use different kinds of strategies, 
But if we use any of this, including guideline compliance, the escalation, switch from IV to oral treatments, therapeutic drug monitoring, um, the very popular use of restricted antibiotics, uh, restricting uh, the use of antibiotics and bedside consultations will lead to significant benefits mortality, shortening of length of stay, adverse events, and reduction in costs. In fact, the, the guideline adherence to empiric therapy, you know when we make recommendations for what to use for certain syndromes on an empiric mode, there is a relative risk reduction of as much as 35% in mortality if our staff would follow our recommendations. And the escalation would also lead to a relative Um, there are similar uh, results from uh, various case studies. So these are not meta-analysis anymore. And they've seen that um, individually or collectively in groups of hospitals, for example, in certain regions in the United States, have seen a marked reduction in uh, the burden of resistant pathogens in the development of C. difficile infections and other similar clinical outcomes, particularly reduction in failure, clinical failure rates. Okay. So what do you mean by monitoring and evaluation um, or what we call AMS M&E? So this is a part of um, the antimicrobial stewardship um, key elements. If you remember, it's a uh, key element number six. There should be some kind of performance evaluation. We should be able to monitor systems and link the measurements of performances and report them to the organization. They should really be embedded. So that's what we're really trying to do, that they're not a separate activity and um, it should not take too much of our time. Uh, we've been trying to train and we've been hearing AMS for like years and years, but we really have not been able as a program and as a country been able to show clear-cut processes, outcomes, and balancing measures to show other practitioners that AMS really works. So some of the AMS measures that have been identified that should be part of our programs are structure measures, process measures, and their definitions are listed here, outcome measures, and balancing measures. Uh, among this, the ones that we usually would like to hear about are the process measures. So this determines whether your policies and your processes are being fo followed correctly. So something like compliance to the use of restricted antibiotics or compliance to the use of uh, certain empiric therapies according to your guidelines. And then outcome measures are also important because you'd really like to link these process measures to what happens to the patient. So does AMS really in your hospital lead to better clinical outcomes, reduction in mortality, reduction in length of stay? So these are the things we'd like to see among the programs we have, we have in our country. So what can we do to, to be able to have measures? So we recommend regular small quality improvement audits so that we can drive changes in prescribing. And each time you have this little, small PDSA cycles, we improve a little bit and a little bit. And over time, this will create big changes in your hospital. We'd like to propose that uh, M&E be facilitated by standardized formats, which uh, 
makes the WHO toolkit very, very useful at this time and have IT systems to help your hospital collect, analyze, and report the data. And timely feedback to the users, to other doctors, to nurses, to your administrators are very important and it leads to better compliance in the future. So where are we now? Uh, last year, during also this PISMID convention, we actually were able to put together 135 AMS teams of hospitals we invited. And we filled out some questions and these are some of the answers. So in the 135, so some, some people didn't answer. So these are some raw data. So it's a mix of level one, level two, and level three hospitals. We ask who trained you. Remember, we uh, showed you earlier, or I showed you earlier, that there were training hubs. So they, the hospitals who were there were trained by Corazon Loxin, by PGH, and by RITM. We ask whether there's an AMS physician and whether this AMS physician is also the infection control physician. And we were surprised that um, half, uh, almost half, 50-50, said that the AMS physician is also the infection control head. And that's sort of difficult and puts the AMS physician in a double jeopardy. Uh, it's very, that, we usually do this in the Philippines. We wear many hats, and but I think this is really a true overload. So talk to your administrators about this if it's a problem to you. Is there an AMS trained, we ask, is there an AMS trained pharmacist in your facility? So uh, we were actually surprised that 20 hospitals said no because uh, uh, we sort of expected that this will be 100% yes, because part of the AMS team that were trained um, is the item of the pharmacist. So um, this is what I was trying to tell you earlier. We would train uh, teams, but the turnaround and the change uh, in the teams might be very fast, requiring frequent uh, availability of trainings. Is there an identified AMS microbiologist? So uh, in some hospitals, perhaps in these hospitals, um, a laboratory might not be present. Uh, there are some level two facilities that do not have a laboratory. Is there an ICC, that's an infection control nurse, assigned to help the AMS committee in your facility. And uh, we were very happy to see that um, indeed the close interaction between the infection control uh, committee and the infection con and the AMS teams are seen here. Uh, they help each other out. They may actually be, actually be sometimes the same person. Is your facility able to analyze microbiology results and produce its own antibiogram. Uh, this, the answer here was mostly um, yes. And we were happy to see this, this because uh, we thought that uh, prior to this questioning, we thought that many hospitals were still unable to produce their antibiograms that because uh, developing antibiograms was one of the skills we taught during the uh, training of AMS. So this is, this is a good result. And in time, we'd like to see all hospitals of level two and level three be able to produce their own antibiograms. Does IT in your facility support AMS activities? So um, earlier I said that it would be good if um, IT support mechanism is present in hospitals to support AMS. And um, this is something that we'll, we will try to address or we've tried to address. And individually, it's good if um, the 
uh, AMS teams will approach their administration and seek help in this regard. So here, has an AMS policy been approved and disseminated for implementation in your facility? Because this is one of the things that is basic and required of all AMS teams. And we've uh, recommended that uh, uh, the AMS teams uh, work on their policy as soon as they come back from training. And at that point, um, 21 out of the 137 were not yet able to have their AMS policies approved. So we worked on these groups and uh, we hope that by now their policies have been approved. Uh, it's very important that an AMS policy is in place to uh, have basis for everything that you're doing um, for your facility. Has there been any treatment guideline that's uh, facility specific uh, been released based on your antibiograms since your training? And um, this is a hard and hard question. And actually, it's a difficult task. It requires a lot of support uh, for individual hospitals to come up with their individual guidelines. So um, we're very flexible in this question. It's good if you will have your own specific uh, recommendations based on your local antibiograms. But we'll work on this question. Does your facility have an approved formulary list or essential medicine list or what we call the EML? And again, this is one of the basic um, things that are required of an AMS team and actually required in the hospitals. So uh, we're working or we've, we've uh, approached the, the hospitals that have been unable to have their own formulary list at that time. Uh, does your facility have a written policy for prescribers um, so that they write the indication in order for all and for all antimicrobial prescriptions. Um, hmm, this is one of the process measures that are recommended by the WHO, that when we write our prescriptions, for example, we write our orders in the chart. Let's say we order, for example, we order ceftriaxone. So when we order ceftriaxone, two grams intravenous every 24 hours, for what? So you're supposed to indicate in that order the indication for the prescription order. And um, it's something easy to do and something easy to implement. So uh, uh, we need to work on this and make our facilities all have written policies about indicating in the order the indication for the prescription. Does your facility have a pre-authorization policy for restricted antibiotics? So this is what I mean by it's very popular. Many hospitals, uh, despite the difficulty of having a pre-authorization policy for restricted antibiotics, are actually able to uh, implement this. Okay. And is there a formal procedure to review appropriateness within 48 hours? Uh, this is something that's evolving and something that we'd like hospitals to be able to do, to review the orders with, that the AMS team is able to review the orders within 48 hours. Uh, has your facility uh, produced an antibiogram? So again, this is a very good answer. Uh, 122 out of 131. And then finally, surgical prophylaxis, is there a system of reviewing? So um, many people would describe surgical prophylaxis as a low-hanging fruit. It's something we can work on quite easily. So for those hospitals who still do not have a way of reviewing their surgical prophylaxis uh, choices and duration, maybe this is an opportunity for improvement. Okay, so there were other questions that we asked about and we'll be asking for the next few uh, 
uh, implementation reviews that we will ask the hospitals to have. Okay. So, um, this is a specific illustration of what AMS evaluations of an AMS evaluation that you can do. <coughs> so, for example, um, choosing certain antibiotics based your, on your antimicrobial uh, patterns in your hospital can make you uh, decide on certain treatment guidelines. And then strategies like um, formulary restriction, prospective audit, and feedback, uh, and their impact. We can do um, measurements like this if we have numbers to work on. Okay. So um, when we talk about having successful implementation or calling our AMS program successful, we really need to have numbers to prove them. We, during the training, we got baseline measures, but uh, we got stuck with baseline measures and we weren't able to measure what hospitals are doing at this time. So that's what we call the post-implementation evaluation. And that's something we'd like to work on. Maybe during this lull of the pandemic and something that uh, will be working with you very soon. So what will you measure? So we'd like you to think about the principles for sustainable measurements. So seek usefulness, not perfection in the measurements. Use a balance between the process outcomes, the process, the outcome, and the cost measures. Keep the measurements simple. Um, make it work like you're getting both qualitative and quantitative data that sort of fits the question you're trying to address or fits a question that you really want to know about. Be clear on the operational definitions of your measures and just start off small. Don't like maybe just initially a few, one ICU, then a few ICUs, and then a few wards. Don't work on a hospital wide level immediately and build on measurements that uh, get into the daily work so that there doesn't need to be an extra activity or extra team that will just do the measurements for you. Example of something doable, as I said, many hospitals have still not been able to have a written policy about indication for prescription. So the WHO uh, measures this and tells us that um, uh, there's a very big room for improvement in this regard. Prescribers should know why they are prescribing certain antibiotics. And that will happen if they are required to write the indication for the prescription. Measure only what's important. So try to keep things very simple. So things like mortality, length of stay, time to respond, Keep that in your daily notes or have like uh, charts that are ready so that you can just fill them up. Um, it, it's very difficult to go back to patient charts. So while you're doing your rounds or while, while the staff is doing the rounds or on a daily or weekly basis, the AMS teams could be doing small nuggets of uh, measurements. Don't try to... Uh, postpone it to the end of the year and then look over all the charts. That's going to be impossible. Okay, Reduce AMR rates and reduce costs are usually very important and interesting measures, especially to the administration and also to, the, to our teams. So it's good to measure them. On antimicrobial consumption, there's... Um, um, as most of us are physicians in the audience, um, the pharmacists actually had, the pharmacists of our AMS teams actually had a training just last November on this. And, uh, but just to let you know that um, AMC or antimicrobial consumption is something that's also important. 
it's usually the pharmacists who will uh, be the ones to do the measurements. They will be the ones to have the numbers. So it's easier for them to deliver this uh, uh, indicators for you. Okay, so these are the different antimicrobial groups that you might want to have measurements on. Okay, and uh, supposedly we're really um, submitting them to either our administration or the DOH, but you would see here that our numbers have been, you know, uh, we got we got also stuck, and there has been no. Uh, updates since 2013 on uh, antimicrobial drug consumptions that are present right now. So we can help the system and know exactly how much antimicrobial consumption numbers we have both in our facilities and collectively, whether in our region or in our country. But the DOH and the WHO and the WIPRO has uh, more numbers based on a uh, smaller uh, number of hospitals. And it helps us understand uh, certain problems related to antimicrobial resistance. Okay, so I really um, would like to see how much of the aware antimicrobials we're using. And in time, the, the WHO would like to see more and more of the use of the access antimicrobials and less and less of the reserve antimicrobials. That's the plan. Uh, the other measure of antimicrobial consumption would be the point prevalence surveys, which uh, we've heard uh, through the point prevalence surveys. Um, there's a, um, just to uh, make us understand a little bit more the association between the metrics or the DDD, daily dose, and the indicators for qualitative, the percent of appropriateness. It's good to understand both of them. So exactly how much we are able to consume and among those consumed, how much, uh, what's the quality of the prescriptions that are put in place? and uh, dispensed. So uh, measures of most of us would be interested in the quality of the prescription, but some of us will be more interested in the quantity of prescription. So it works both ways and it's good to have both numbers. Okay, so that ends this part of the workshop. Uh, the challenges related to having monitoring and evaluation numbers. I'd like to move over to the next speaker now. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry for that uh, 
Hello, Emily, and hello, everybody. Um, okay, we had some uh, technical problems, but we're back. And I'd like to move on to the next part of the um, uh, workshop. And we're actually very, very fortunate to uh, have as our next speaker. Somebody who's all the way from the University of Utah. Okay. And we're very happy that she agreed to speak with us and be with us today to give a lecture on antimicrobial stewardship. She's Associate Professor of Medicine at the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Utah Health. She's co-director of the AMS programs at the University of Utah Health and the Salt Lake City Veterans Affairs Healthcare System. She's a member of the Public Policy and Government Affairs Committee and the AMS Committee of the Society of Healthcare Epidemiology in America and the Vice Chair of the IDSA Antimicrobial Resistance Committee. Let's all please welcome Dr. Emily Spivak. Thank you so much for that kind uh, introduction. Can you hear me okay? Can you all hear me? I just wanna make sure real quick. I'm gonna assume that you can. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, to speak. Um, and I'm gonna to talk to you about and sort of it clearly um, follows the last lecture, the importance of measuring, of measurement and reporting um, the impact uh, of your stewardship program. And, and really the, the to me, um, what is most important about all of those measurement uh, pieces that were discussed in the last lecture. So the objectives for this talk, by the end, you should be able to recognize um, that what is called tracking and reporting is recommended in the United States by our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the CDC as really one of the core elements or one of the backbones of stewardship. You should also be able to discuss why measurement and reporting of data is important for stewardship and what really the functions are of measuring and reporting and what, um, what that accomplishes. You should be able to discuss various process and outcome measures that are used by stewardships to stewardship programs. So your AMS is my ASP. So ASP standing for antimicrobial or antibiotic stewardship program. So you should be able to discuss the various process and outcome measures that we use uh, to monitor our programs and assess our impact and identify uh, these process and outcome measures, again, that you can follow locally and, and think about it, your own programs and your own hospitals, how you may translate or implement some of the things that I talk about. So this is just a snapshot again from the, in the United States, the CDC's um, core elements of hospital antibiotic stewardship programs or AMSs or ASPs. Um, and as you can see here, looking down at core elements um, five and six, five is tracking. Um, which CDC defines as monitoring antibiotic prescribing and resistance patterns. So that is what CDC in the United States highlights that we measure, again, antibiotic use and resistance. But I'm going to talk to you about some other metrics uh, or data that, in my opinion, you should measure um, and why. And then reporting is another core element, um, which they define as regular reporting uh, of information on antibiotic use and resistance to doctors, nurses, and other relevant hospital uh, staff and leadership. Um, I gave a talk recently about a week or two ago <clears throat> with folks from CDC to very rural, uh, what we call critical access hospitals in the United States. And we talked to them about this core element of tracking uh, and reporting and pointed out to them that measurement is really critical uh, first and foremost, to identify where problems are in your hospital and to identify opportunities for improvement. Um, and then after you identify those opportunities and you implement a stewardship intervention to then uh, follow that up with measurement uh, to assess the impact of your intervention. So you're measuring to as a roadmap to find the problems, but also then once you attack them or once you intervene on them to, to measure and make sure that you had the intended uh, effect. 
um, summary information or measurement of antibiotic use and resistance along um, with other antimicrobial stewardship program process and outcome measures uh, should be shared regularly again with hospital staff, uh, relevant staff, physicians and nurses and leadership. Uh, and uh, in the United States, we recommend sharing that not only with clinical providers, but with hospital leadership and the hospital board who essentially will back us up and uh, give us um, commitment and resources um, and an authority to do our job. Um, and I would also highlight the regular reporting of data. Um, so again, antibiotic use process measures and outcome measures for stewardship also serve as an intervention, showing people their data either about antibiotic use or maybe how they diagnose or maybe misdiagnose an infection, that type of feedback of practice patterns and clinical uh, a provider groups data on how they use antibiotics actually can serve as an intervention to open their eyes to where some of the problems are and how they might improve. In reporting um, data and the impacts that you make as a stewardship program also will increase visibility um, and trust and buy-in with clinicians and hospital leaders. The hospital leader part I would point out is really, really important because if you don't show them your data and show them your impact, they really will not see you, not understand what you're doing. And I find that that sharing that data and highlighting your successes with leadership translate in, not only into trust, but also more resources. And by that, I usually mean in the United States, money to pay for pharmacists, physicians, nurses to actually be dedicated to do the stewardship work and not be stretched too thin. And it will make your program more impactful in the long run and give you um, uh, more sustainability. In the United States, we have something called the National Quality Forum. And this group about four years ago in 2016, put together what they called a practical playbook for antibiotic stewardship in acute care, so in, um, in hospitals. And they have a great section in there on um, measurements, so on tracking and reporting. And they, they break down um, sort of what they see as basic stewardship measurement, intermediate measurement and advanced measurement. And process measures, which we'll talk about more in a minute, they define as really being basic and the first, one of the first things that stewardship programs uh, should measure and define process measures as specific steps in a process that lead either positively or negatively, but hopefully with stewardship positively to a particular outcome uh, that you want to have happen. An outcome measure is a higher level clinical or financial like cost outcome um, that will, uh, it would be of concern to not only providers, but also to a whole healthcare organization or hospital leadership as things like length of stay, readmissions in the United States and cost uh, are um, outcome measures that clinicians and administrators or leaders in our hospital care about because they affect the finances of the hospital. The National Quality Forum defines antibiotic use measurement, so quantitatively measuring antibiotic use as an advanced metric. Um, that's a little bit different than the Centers for Disease Control or CDC in the US, which really um, encourages measuring antibiotic use first and foremost, and that most hospitals in the United States should be able to measure their antibiotic use. And I personally view measuring antibiotic use not only as a process measure, but an outcome. Um, again, as I've mentioned, measuring antibiotic use really um, sort of lifts the, the hood, like the hood on your car, and you can see underneath and see what's happening. So it shows you where the problems are. And then as you work to solve those problems, it becomes an outcome measure because then you're sort of tracking to make sure that the improvements that you hoped would happen are actually happening. So I'd encourage people to look at this playbook. It's readily available on the internet, um, and it has some great um, tips for uh, addressing barriers and problems and um, uh, roadblocks to getting stewardship um, up and running and also uh, ways to, to get at how to measure these uh, process and outcome measures. In the quality world, again, just restating the same thing, sort of um, healthcare quality 101, um, there's a quote uh, in this book cited here that you cannot, met, you cannot manage what you do not measure. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And so, again, whether we're talking about antibiotic use, a particular clinical outcome or process measure, um, that's why it is so important to measure. I don't know how anyone would just sort of go in blindly and start um, trying to, to say something or do something about antibiotic use because you don't know where the problems are until you measure uh, or collect data uh, on uh, antibiotic use. And so 
uh, measurements is really, really important to understand how to um, develop and structure your stewardship program and then measure your impact ongoing. I also like to point out, I think it was mentioned in the last lecture that there are also structure measures. Um, and in the United States, again, with the CDC's core elements of antibiotic stewardship in acute care hospitals at the end of that document, again, which is readily available on the internet, um, there is essentially a, um, a checklist uh, of, um, with each core measure, um, various um, uh, subsets or various sub-elements of that core measure. And many hospitals in the US use this checklist essentially as a gap analysis to assess the infrastructure or the structure of their stewardship program and make sure that they have all of these key pieces in place. So again, it's not looking at antibiotic use at an individual hospital or a, an individual ward, but assessing from a programmatic level, do we have all the pieces and all the people that we need? And so I would encourage you to think about that as a metric as well, to make sure your stewardship program is, has all the pieces and the people and the infrastructure it needs to be successful. So let's talk a little bit more, and I'm going to give you some examples of the way that we measure uh, and report process measures. So some examples, again, some of these were mentioned in the last slide, but to give a little bit more detail, process measures for stewardship, some examples and things that we report are things like adherence to documentation policies. So for instance, at our hospital, we have a requirement in our electronic health record for almost every antibiotic that when a um, provider orders it, they have to pick uh, from a preset selection of indications. Um, we can measure adherence to this simply because you cannot, you cannot sign the order or put the antibiotic order through um, without um, putting in an indication. But you would, if you have that policy in place, you should audit it and make sure that people are adhering to that policy. Adherence to facility treatment guidelines, so like for community-acquired pneumonia or urinary tract infections, um, we audit those as well, specifically through our prospective audit and feedback or antibiotic prospective reviews. Um, we can follow and see how many patients with pneumonia are people following our guidelines. And I can tell you right now, it's about 40%. It's not great, but it's better than some places. We also um, oftentimes measure the number and the type of stewardship uh, recommendations that we make, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, and then we sometimes will follow up, you know, 24 hours later and measure, um, okay, so we, we intervened on somebody on vancomycin without evidence of an MRSA infection the next day, did the team or did the physicians follow our recommendations, and that's, that's sort of... Um, called adherence to stewardship interventions or how often were our recommendations followed. And so these are not clinical outcomes, but clearly are all um, steps in the process to improving antibiotic use. And if none of these things are being followed uh, and you don't have good adherence to your process measures, um, then it's not even worth measuring <laughs> antibiotic use yet because you will not have necessarily improved it. So as an example, uh, again, I was part of a group, uh, and this was many years ago now, but that developed some tools, essentially some checklists that are available uh, on CDC's website for assessing um, appropriateness of antibiotics for various infections and appropriateness of various um, types of antibiotics like anti-MRSA uh, antibiotics. And um, one way that you could um, sort of assess whether people are adhering um, with your local guideline would be develop something like this, develop a chart audit tool, uh, or you may turn your guidelines sort of into a checklist and once a month or twice a year, whatever frequency you want to, pull up patients with pneumonia or urinary tract infections and retrospectively go through the charts and see how people adhered uh, with recommended diagnosis, uh, empiric definitive antibiotics and duration of therapy for various uh, syndromes or diagnoses. We did this, for instance, at the Salt Lake City Veterans Affairs Hospital a couple of years ago um, and found um, that uh, we had very uh, long <laughs> durations of antibiotic uh, treatment for urinary tract infections and realized um, that we had a guideline, but nobody was adhering to it because uh, we do not recommend 14 days of therapy. And that highlighted an area where um, the process was not being followed and we needed to make an intervention to improve uh, the antibiotic use. We also um, <clears throat> use antibiotic restrictions 
at the Salt Lake City VA. And we started doing that, as you can see on the x-axis in 2013. Um, and up until 2016 is when this data is. We, we don't really follow this that much anymore because we've, we've got, we're so successful to be honest with you and, and don't really need to follow this anymore. But we followed from the beginning and over time, the number of antibiotic, restricted antibiotic requests that we got in what was our recommendation. Did we approve it in blue? Did we not approve it in red? The green ones are where there was some missing data. But as you can see, um, the point is that over time, we had fewer and fewer requests for restricted antimicrobials, essentially because we were teaching people how we wanted them to use these drugs. And they started understanding and didn't have to request or were essentially were just not using the restricted drugs uh, anymore. And at the beginning, you can see uh, in red, there were far more uh, restricted drugs that were not approved again because they were inappropriately requested or people were trying to misuse them. And that improved over time uh, as people, again, we were able to teach them uh, how we wanted to uh, wanted them to use antibiotics. But this is a way, a visual way to think about tracking and reporting uh, uh, your interventions uh, on restricting drugs. We also do a lot of prospective audit and feedback at the two programs that I run meaning um, pretty much daily. We have a uh, pharmacist and then with backup from me, reviewing patients, surgical patients, medical patients who are on antibiotics. Um, and uh, we do it essentially from the get-go within 24 hours of them being written or ordered. And we um, make a lot of interventions on these, on these drugs. We developed at both places notes in our electronic health record that allowed us to not only communicate our recommendations really clearly in a documented way where we were willing to put our recommendations in the chart um, and create a trust and buy-in from providers, but also by documenting in this structured way, we were able to capture this data and then retrospectively um, pull it back out and quantify it. And I'll show you that in a minute. This is an example of, um, this is just two screenshots because I couldn't do it in one of the notes that we write. You can see, we can pick the drug that we're um, reviewing and recommending changes on. We um, sort of check what the indication is. We sometimes, you know, we'll write a sort of free text couple sentences here on what we're thinking. And then we check what our recommendations are, whether it's to narrow or stop the drug, uh, maybe switch from IV to oral, change the dosing. Sometimes we recommend ID consults. Um, but again, anything that's a checkbox here is captured in a database so that we can then pull that data out and see what our recommendations were. And again, for example, this is just looking at um, about a year and a half's worth of data. But from those notes that we left, we could see that the most common um, drugs that we are doing uh, prospective interventions or prospective audit and feedback on uh, is Piperacil and Tazobactam that you can see here in pink, and then vancomycin that is in the light green with a smattering of other uh, drugs like fluoroquinolones um, and ceftriaxone. And so that really made sense to us, but also we were able to show that to providers and show that to, whoo, excuse me, to administrators. Um, to show them that these drugs are very commonly vancomycin and zosin misused and require our intervention. And then the types of recommendations that we make on those drugs, so we could capture what drug we're intervening on and what our recommendations were. In orange, you can see the clearly most common recommendation was to narrow. People were using too broad spectrum of a drug for whatever the indication was. Um, and then the second most common in light blue was to stop the drug because the patient either wasn't infected or had already finished uh, antibiotic therapy. So these visuals were actually very, um, when we presented them to pharmacy and hospital leadership, um, they were convinced, oh, okay, we didn't realize that there was a problem with how we use these antibiotics. And this really showed them that we were doing work and that it was meaningful and we had something to say when we reviewed these antibiotics. Another example of collecting process um, measures <clears throat> at the University of Utah, so a different hospital, but right here in Salt Lake City up the hill from the other one. Um, it, it, this is a couple years ago. We implemented a rapid diagnostic or a PCR on our blood cultures. And when we first implemented that for the first couple of weeks, um, well, well, always now, <laughs> we intervene on these. We review them. We get called by the microbiology lab when the result um, pops up, and we uh, make sure the patient's on appropriate therapy. But for the first two weeks when this was rolled out, we collected data on um, how many 
blood cultures um, we were called about. Um, how often was there an opportunity to say something? Did we need to make a change in the therapy? And as you can see, um, about 60% of all these patients um, needed an intervention based on what drugs they were or were not on in the blood culture results. And we made 33 recommendations in 22 patients. And you can see we tracked and looked how many of our recommendations were accepted. And these were our recommendations. Most, you know, most commonly patients are on too broad spectrum. And so we recommended narrowing. We recommended a lot of ID consults because we have a lot of Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia. Um, a few times we needed to broaden or add therapy, but you can see we had about an 80% acceptance rate. So this was really important information that providers and leadership um, was impressed when they saw that this was at monitoring blood cultures using this expensive diagnostic um, was really impactful. There was a lot of opportunity to improve antibiotic use and most people do what we say. So it was well worth our time to do this. So let's switch gears and talk about antibiotic use data. And let's talk a little bit, again, I encourage you to think about antibiotic use data in two ways. There's, there's the quantity, just quantities of antibiotics, and then there's the quality, how um, appropriate is that antibiotic use? So you guys um, probably know and have your own sources of antimicrobial or antibiotic usage data. This is a screenshot from, in the United States, the Joint Commission has a really good toolkit on antibiotic measurement, if you wanna look through that and it gives literally equations and ways to calculate antibiotic use. But in the United States, depending on hospital capabilities, we talk about different sources of data. And some hospitals use pharmacy doses that are purchased. Some use doses that are dispensed from the hospital. The hospitals where I work at, we use doses charted as given, meaning what did the patient actually uh, receive? Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to using all of these types of data, starting with what we use. Again, we use doses charted as given in the United States. We call that BCMA data or barcode, barcoded medication administration. Essentially, the patient has a band on their arm that gets scanned by the nurse. Um, uh, and it, that links the drug with essentially their medical record. Um, and that's how it gets documented in a database. This is very accurate data. It reflects really true antimicrobial usage, but the, some limitations are it requires a lot of electronic data infrastructure, um, accurate charting. So again, it does require the nurse to scan the patient's um, armband. Um, and it can be expensive because again, of the infrastructure, uh, informatics infrastructure that's needed. Doses dispensed, again, that's what's actually sent to the floor from the pharmacy. This, most pharmacies have this data. It's pretty easy to obtain. It's more accurate than purchasing data I'll talk about in a second. It is linked to individual patients, but not all of that drug that gets to the medical floor gets to the patient. And so it does overestimate usage a little bit. I'm using, at least in the United States, the purchase data, so what our pharmacy actually buys, again, is very easy to data, data to get. I could ask somebody tonight and probably get a report by tomorrow about you know, how much uh, septerylene or something we bought um, in the last six months. But the problem is uh, most of it is sitting on the shelf. It has not been given to patients. And so that's not very accurate, uh, a very accurate representation of what is used for that specific drug um, in our hospital. And so you'd have to understand the, the, the relationship between what you purchase and what you use and what is just stocked up essentially on the shelf. So those are various types of ways to get data. But I always tell hospitals in the United States, if you don't have antibiotic use data, start by asking. If you have an electronic health record, asking pharmacy and specifically pharmacy informatics where that data is captured and ask pharmacy for reports on this kind of stuff because that's where the that's where the most knowledge will be about how to get antibiotic use data. But when you're talking about antibiotic use or antimicrobial measurement, uh, I think some of the take homes, I find that people get really hung up on making sure, well, we need to get the barcode administration or the days of therapy data and, or they, they wanna get every intricate antibiotic by every intricate floor. And I'd say pick something to start to measure and trend it over time. I tell some hospitals, if you don't have anything, just start with vancomycin. That's like a really commonly used drug in the United States. Just measure vancomycin. Just measure vancomycin and Pipercil and Tazobactam. Don't try and attack every drug and get data on every drug from the beginning. You always will need to normalize your quantitative antibiotic use to some numerator, I'm sorry, dump some denominator 
of the quantity of patient um, admissions that you have. So in the United States with CDC, we use that by what's defined as days present. How many um, uh, days did, were patients um, present in different units in the hospital? It gets kind of complicated. Or how many patient days uh, are represented in the hospital? The other easy way to do it is just to, to adjust it by admissions. Uh, for a whole hospital or for a particular unit. Again, in the United States, we use something, our antibiotic use metric is called days of therapy per thousand um, uh, patient days or days present, and that's gained popularity. And that's the metric that CDC uses in something called our National Healthcare Safety Network Antibiotic Use Option. And that is the um, surveillance um, uh, database where we submit antibiotic use nationally to CDC in the United States. Um, and, and I'd encourage you, you know, I'm not comfortable and would never try and manipulate this data or aggregate it by myself. Um, I ask for help <laughs> and ask for pharmacy help and have ph really great pharmacy informaticists who help us with this. Some examples of ways to look at this and the reason you may want to look at antibiotic use, starting at a very high level. This is um, very somewhat old data, but from our, our VA hospital here, again, looking at time on the x-axis. And this is antibiotic use per thousand days present on the y-axis. And this is just all antibiotics, including all classes and spectrum. And you can see um, sort of with the trend line that it jumps around and bounces uh, quite a bit throughout the year. But the general trend, um, and we didn't start doing stewardship there until 2013, but it has that antibiotic use has been going down over time. We also then break that use down by, okay, and this is again, all antibiotics, but what did we break out and look at in black intensive care units? Our red uh, is medical or medical surgical floors um, and in other types of floors uh, you can see down here. And not surprisingly, um, we had very high usage in black in our intensive care units. And we worked really hard starting in 2013 to bring that down. And there's a lot of noise in this graph, but we were, able to get antibiotic use down um, sort of closer to our medical uh, floor uh, antibiotic use uh, as we brought our ICUs down. And then sort of smoothing things out. So this is some specific floors on our university. Um, I'm sorry, on our uh, Veterans Affairs Hospital. The yellow uh, is our medical intensive care unit and the red is our surgical. So a surgical intensive care is very different in the United States than a medical intensive care. And um, it, we, when we looked at this and again, separate out the two ICUs, it was really interesting to us and somewhat alarming <laughs> that the use was more stable, less noisy in our surgical intensive care than it was in our medical intensive care. And what we found was some of this antibiotic use jumping around was actually provider specific. There were providers um, on, for instance, in September who were essentially worse antibiotic users than those who came on at some other months. So this highlighted to us some provider differences and some unit differences with the different types of patients that they had. So these are examples for you guys of ways to visualize antibiotic use data. And when you, when you dive deeper into the data, you start to see differences or, or areas that you may want to um, look closer at. We also are able to lump them into um, on the top, so anti-staphylococcal antibiotic use, so MRSA and MSSA drugs, and on the right, broad spectrum uh, gram-negative drugs, as you can see listed there. Um, and on the top left, again, when we started our stewardship program, we, we worked really hard to decrease vancomycin use. There was a lot of unnecessary vancomycin use in the United States. And you can see that um, the whole point of this graph over time as we trended it was again to show as a sort of outcome metric um, that our antibiotic use did go down. We often recommend cefazolin in place of vancomycin because people don't have MRSA. So we were not surprised when we looked at sort of a balancing measure that cefazolin went up a little bit. And then on the bottom, you can see our Piptazo in black uh, use was very high uh, when we started and we've been successful uh, at bringing that down uh, as well. Uh, this light green here is miropenem or carbapenem use, um, which when I started doing stewardship, uh, again, sort of right in here, um, in, the, in between 2012 and 2013, we restricted that drug because there's really, in my opinion, no indication for it empirically. Um, 
here at this hospital because we have very little resistant gram negative uh, infections. Um, and we were able to really get our carbapenem use down very, very low uh, by restricting the drug. So again, these graphs um, showed essentially the impact of what we did on antibiotic use. So let's wrap up and talk about outcome measures. There's a lot of different outcome measures to think about. Again, we've talked about clinical outcome measures um, and cost measures. Um, again, some examples are tracking antibiotic resistance patterns over time. I would um, caution you that antibiotic resistance is very hard on a sort of individual hospital or even a hospital system level to impact because there are so many other um, competing and influencing factors like uh, community antibiotic use um, and pa patient complexity and patients coming in and out. But this is something that we track. We just don't hold ourselves accountable to our resistance patterns on our hospital antibiogram. Clostridium difficile infection rates are something that we also watch very closely. For any intervention that we do almost, um, we track 30-day mortality uh, and readmission rates. One, to just curiously see if uh, we improve any of those things, but mainly, again, as balancing measures to make sure that there's no harm caused by any of our stewardship interventions. We often now look at length of stay, I'll show you, because as was mentioned in the last lecture, again, at least in the United States, um, if you can get people on oral antibiotics or get them stopped, suddenly providers want to discharge them home. And so a lot of the interventions that we make reduce length of stay, which in the United States saves a lot of money because the bed fee, the hospital fee for an overnight stay is where a lot of the cost comes from. Um, sometimes we track adverse drug events like with MRSA, I'm sorry, with vancomycin and, and, and Zosin. We uh, watch a lot of, uh, of our renal failure rates and make sure that um, we're improving um, uh, or reducing nephrotoxicity when we reduce those drugs, uh, use of those drugs. And then I've taken in the last few years to pulling in cost data um, once I figured out how to get it for many of our interventions because I have found whether it's drug cost, laboratory, reducing use of laboratories and saving money there, reducing length of stay. There are all these hidden costs that we reduce and we save a lot of money. And then I can feed that information back to show our value and many times to advocate for more resources for our team. So here's an example again of an outcome, just trend, trending resistance. So we do, agri we, we um, put together an antibiogram every year, but showing people an antibiogram um, is really hard for them visually to look at. And so we populate essentially just into Excel for some uh, organisms of interest, what the susceptibility are to some of our priority uh, antibiotics for those organisms over, over years so that we can see if there's any changes happening. Um, and you can see here uh, with our pseudomonas susceptibilities on the, um, on the upper left, um, I don't know if these numbers are really all that significant aside from the levofloxacin numbers, but that we saw essentially some improvements in susceptibilities to some of our anti-pseudomonal agents in the first couple of years of our program. Um, Clostridium difficile infection data, at least in the United States, again, um, this is really where we overlap with our infection prevention and control teams. Um, we often get this data from them. Um, and I would encourage folks to, to ask your infection preventionist for this data if you don't have it. Um, and this is where we, we collaborate with them. We do a lot of interventions on not only reducing antibiotic use if there's C. diff uh, infection problems in a particular unit or hospital, but we also help with diagnostics um, and what we call diagnostic stewardship, um, because as you all probably know, uh, what tests you use to diagnose C. diff really affects your infection rates. Um, as uh, in the United States, gosh, probably 10 years ago now, we switched to molecular testing just upfront, let's just do a PCR on everybody. And clearly that increased our C. diff rates. And we have now realized we were detecting a lot of asymptomatic colonization. So we've worked on some interventions to reduce unnecessary C. difficile testing, which will reduce infection rates, um, as well as reduce an unnecessary antibiotic use. And we track again and show these rates um, in our annual report. Um, again, I don't, I, I don't personally feel like our antibiotic stewardship programs have reduced our C. diff rates. Um, per se, we'll see if a latest diagnostic stewardship intervention that we did has, but we trend these over time uh, as part of our annual report, and it tends to, to bounce around. Um, and we also overlay it with where various stewardship interventions um, were, as you can see here in 2013, and when we, we switched to different testing 
methodologies for C. diff again because they can uh, affect your, um, your infection rates. And then this is just some data, some pro I wanted to show this as like an aggregated way to think about how you might report data for an intervention. So a couple of years ago in 2017 at the University of Utah, we did not have a standard guideline or way we wanted our providers to treat community acquired pneumonia. So we got a multidisciplinary group together. We developed our best practice, what, what the diagnostics were that we wanted people to do, what empiric and definitive antibiotics, duration of therapy, and we had a really robust um, intervention that we put together with an electronic order set that was coupled with daily review of pneumonia patients by our stewardship pharmacist and myself, where we provided feedback in real time to get people essentially back on the pathway or back in the guideline. And when we looked pre-intervention, um, as you can see on the left versus post-intervention, we decided ahead of time, okay, we're going to collect data on our, our process measures are going to be the labs that we want ordered. Um, as our outcome measures, we wanted to look at antibiotic duration and our length of stay, our mortality, our readmission rates, and we wanted to measure some cost data. And when we looked at all this, you know, a lot of our process measures were followed, significant increases in use of the diagnostics that we wanted to be used. We saw a reduction in IV duration of antibiotics because we had these patients um, switched automatically to oral antibiotics. And when we've looked since, our total antibiotic duration dropped significantly and almost every patient now gets only five days uh, for pneumonia. Importantly, we found that we dropped length of stay by about three quarters of a day, which in the United States is a lot. That essentially almost is a whole day based on the timing of, of um, when people come in and out of the beds and when they get charged for them. And at the bottom here, um, my hospital makes me not show you dollars, but shows you a relative a sort of mean cost or a reduction in cost. And I can just tell you, we saved about a million dollars in one year on like 300 patients, as you can see, yeah, 368 patients with pneumonia. Um, and most of this was because of our reductions in length of stay. But that, that cost savings um, in um, a, of a million dollars in length of stay bought me another pharmacist. It, it, I presented this to our leadership. They um, were impressed um, with uh, you know, a relatively few number of patients, how we were able to save that much money um, and invested more money in, in resources and staff for our program. And then of course we showed um, that mortality and 30 day readmissions were stable. So the last thing, just to put it all together, I wanted to show, and I'm happy to share any of these documents um, if people would like them. Um, we do put together, I'm working on it for the university hospital, but for the VA hospital, we have an annual stewardship report. And um, the, this slide and the next one is just some sort of screenshots of the types of things that we report and have reported over time, again, to, for our own purposes, to make sure we are accomplishing what we set out and intended to accomplish, but also to show leadership our value um, and to show providers um, the changes that we have made over time. And so this is an example of just showing, you know, we, we um, started in 2013. So our baseline is uh, 2012 and we show the percent change in total antibiotic use, anti-MRSA drugs, broad spectrum gram negatives, et cetera. Um, from 2012 to 2015, and then we've essentially compared almost every year since then uh, to 2012. And we do see some things jump around, uh, but if these not, I, I could explain all of these numbers and why some things are not, have um, fallen off and why some things have changed more since 2012. And like, for instance, surgical prophylaxis, that has increased because in the United States, the Faslin is considered a surgical prophylaxis drug. And um, we encourage a lot of people to use that for treatment when they start vancomycin, but they don't really need MRSA coverage, they just need strep coverage. So that's an example of a way that we present some of this antibiotic use data. And then we also put it in pretty graphs so that people can see it as well. These are years on the x-axis and the yellow bars are just total all classes antibiotic use um, in our days of therapy per, per thousand patient days. And then the different colored lines are different uh, sort of smaller groups of antibiotic classes. So the purple um, is, oh, sorry, the, um, the black is our broad spectrum uh, community gram negative antibiotics. Um, the blue is uh, MRSA drugs. So you can see again over time how we reduce that. 
and the green is our sort of MDRO gram negative drug. So we really have targeted the green and the blue since 2013. Um, and we've seen some leveling and we've had some fatigue. So some of these things have bounced back up. Um, but, um, you know, this is a way to show people again that we have accomplished what we set out to accomplish. Um, so in summary, measurement and reporting and stewardship is critical and it's important to do it. So first and foremost, that you can identify problems um, in, your, in your hospitals and opportunities uh, for stewardship interventions to improve care. Um, and then after you, <laughs> you know, it, it roll out an intervention or quality improvement initiative, uh, measurement is how you assess your impact. You really obviously need to, to, to measure and make sure that you're doing what you intended to and not causing any harm. And then also it's really fun in my opinion to measure um, antibiotic use and your impact of your interventions and just show it to providers because it, it gives to them positive feedback, but also if it's not so great and the antibiotic use doesn't look so good, showing them data can be really impactful as an intervention to help them improve. And also um, presenting this data to hospital leadership, I have found incredibly important to highlight our value to uh, create respect for what we do and also to leverage for more resources to grow our program. So I will stop there um, and you let me know <laughs> if we have questions now or if you, if you, what we do next. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Emily Spivak, all the way from uh, Utah. It's uh, I think nighttime there right now. So um, there are some questions in the Q&A box. Who's responsible for interpreting the hospital antibiograms? In your hospital, Dr. Emily, who's responsible for doing that? So is, we, um, our microbiology lab is responsible for um, aggregating the data and putting it together. We, so as far as interpreting it goes, the stewardship program is responsible for helping clinicians understand what that data means and how to interpret the data. Um, but the microbiology lab is who puts that data together for us. And we work with them on validating the data. Okay, similar here in the Philippines, yeah. The microbiologists work on it first and then we discuss in the, uh, the clinicians will like discuss what the recommendations will be based on the uh, based on the data. Okay, so the next question is, um, any surveys on compliance to antibiotic guidelines? What is the question again? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Were there, are there any surveys that have been done on compliance to antibiotic guidelines? There are. Um, there's lots of them in the United States. The problem is that every hospital here has their own guidelines, and we do have some national guidelines, but I don't think they're as um, streamlined as they are in other countries around the world. And so, uh, but many individual hospitals and health systems here do uh, surveys to assess uh, adherence with their guidelines, and, and much of that has been um, published where you can find sort of single, single center, single hospital evaluations of that. Again, those forms that I put in my talk that are on CDC's website, and I can get you that link um, for assessing antibiotic use, those are meant to start as a way to sort of assess adherence with uh, national IDSA guidelines and best practices for pneumonia, urinary tract infections, and skin and soft tissue infections. So they could serve as a survey to assess appropriateness for those diagnoses. Okay. Um, there, I think there's a question for Dr. Kabad. Is she still here? Uh, present. Present. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, it's an anonymous uh, audience. Uh, can we shift um, in the treatment of COVID because you spoke on COVID? Uh, can we shift the IV dexamethasone to oral? Yes, we can. So you can use the same dose of uh, dexamethasone when you switch to oral, especially if the patient's getting better and uh, they can take something orally. So that will be a great uh, 
kind of a de-escalation of sorts, or actually just streamlining from IV to oral, like we talked about. So you can do that for sure. Okay. To Dr. Abad and to Dr. Spiva, diagnosis of from Dr. Mafi Taizon, diagnosis of HAP and VAP is challenging because of many conditions that mimic them. Do you use scoring systems like CPIS and biomarkers like CRP Procal for diagnosis and monitoring response to treatment? So I try and get people to use the CPIS score, but uh, it's not um, systematically implemented in our hospitals, but I like that score. And I think it's effective way to be reevaluating the patient over time um, and reassessing the diagnosis. I do not like although we do it, how people commit to HAP, VAP, and just give an antibiotic course, um, even though many times the patient does not, I don't think, have that diagnosis. Um, we, in the hospitals I work at, do not use um, procalcitonin and CRP or other inflammatory markers for these diagnoses, um, simply because many of our patients who will have HAP and VAP will have other reasons, they're very complicated and will have other reasons to have those biomarkers elevated. And so they actually, in my opinion, work against our stewardship initiatives. And so we more preferentially use things like the CPIS score as a stewardship program when we're making interventions on those patients. Sibel, do you oh, have this? Can I just agree with Dr. Spina? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with what she said. And um, I think, it, the procalcitonin and the CRP can work against us, as I mentioned, especially for COVID-19 with severe illness, those tend to be elevated. So then you'll have to look for other uh, inflammatory markers or other surrogate markers rather to try and decide whether or not you have a concomitant HAP or a VAP. So for the Philippines where we don't have a lot of um, film arrays or PCR-based tests that will then boil down to getting really good culture samples. Okay. So there are several questions on when the next AMS training for hospitals would be. Um, so actually, there's no exact date yet for actually, we invited the AMS teams here. So thank you very much for uh, being with us in this workshop. I hope you uh, were able to learn a lot from our speakers. Um, the next training will probably be virtual still and maybe it will happen next uh, next quarter first quarter of next year so we'll let you know we'll let the hospitals who still need training uh, know that information are there specific the next question are there specific trainings for med techs for them to be qualified as microbiologists so um I'm not sure. The, I'm not sure of the exact question, but uh, um, there will be training for for accreditation of microbiology laboratories. There will be a training specifically for that for AMR. In case the next question, in case of long term treatment like penicillin G, how will you know if the treatment is still working? Are there any guidelines for this? Hmm. Sibel, do you want to answer that? Sorry, sorry, I missed the question. Is it in, in case of long-term treatment like PENG, how will you know if the treatment is still working? So I think it boils down to clinical response uh, of the patient. So you go back to the patient and uh, kind of look at what you're treating. So if it's PENG, for example, are you treating um, well, like a soft tissue infection? So it boils down to whether or not the soft tissue site is getting better. So it really boils down to clinical parameters rather than any um, diagnostic test sometimes. Uh, I don't think there are any guidelines for this. So again, it probably depends on what you're treating, uh, what syndrome you're treating uh, or what disease you're treating. Okay, um, there are some more questions. We'll spend five more minutes and then we'll give the certificates. Uh, the proposed process flow by Dr. Abad for assessment of patients who will need antibiotics in the context of COVID-19 is a good guide. Are there any plans to come up with a national guideline for this so that clinicians will be guided? 
Hmm. Hmm. Um, do you want to answer, Sibel? <laughs> so, so I appreciate that. Thank you. I just simplified what is already there, really. So we actually have uh, PSMID guidelines out there. And it's if you Google it and put PSMID and um, COVID-19, for example, the treatment guidelines will come up. It's a very lengthy document, but uh, worth uh, your time reading and going over it. Uh, and really, that's where I got my simplified version. So there are guide, there is guidance already in terms of uh, what to do with um, different uh, types of COVID-19 that come in. So whether it's mild to severe or critical illness, uh, we do have some national guidelines that are uh, always, uh, it's kind of a living document. So it's always being updated. It was last updated in July. And hopefully we can update it soon because there, as you know, there's a lot of changes now with COVID-19 treatment. Right. Okay, um, there was a question. Um, maybe Dr. Emily can answer this. What is your recommendation on reporting frequency of the AMR per hospital? Yeah, I mean, ideally, I think you would report. Um, it depends on who you're reporting to, um, but we report to multiple different committees like our pharmacy committee, our clinical leadership committee, our quality committee. We try and hit most of them quarterly, which is a lot. Um, and with COVID, we've not been able to sustain that because we've been pulled into doing other things. But I think keep to keep people um, aware of what you're doing and hearing you and seeing you, ideally you would be doing it four times a year or quarterly. Okay. Four times quarterly, oh my. <laughs> oh, sorry, I said four times a year or quarterly, so. Okay, all right. So um, there's one question, I think. Uh, how soon can you repeat same antibiotic on same patient who responds with it, who responds to it? Yeah. So I think it, it sort of goes back to that other question. It depends on clinical improvement. And I often find that people think, Somebody has pneumonia, they had it two months ago, I can't use the same antibiotic I, that I used then. And that's absolutely not true for the vast majority of people because they're not having another, for instance, for many of these things like urinary tract infections or pneumonia, they're not having another infection because they suddenly have a resistant organism. It's a, it's a path, it's a pathophysiologic reason that they have recurrence. So for urinary tract infections, it's people who can't void spontaneously or they have indwelling catheters. They're just at risk for recurrent infections. Mm -hmm. And so they happen over and over again, many times with susceptible organisms. Mm -hmm. And same with pneumonia, people who have, I mean, we all aspirate, but people who sort of macro aspirate or are more susceptible or have impaired local immunity in their lungs, they're who are going to get pneumonia over and over again. But it doesn't mean that your antibiotic has failed. It's just that unfortunately that they are higher risk of infection in these sites. So I often use the same antibiotic on people um, and don't just keep escalating when infections come back because usually it's just an underlying reason that they are susceptible to recurrent infections. Okay, so I hope you got that. I hope, I mean, the audience is listening to, to us, Dr. Spivak, that's very important. Okay, uh, there's a question from Rachel. Is it already required to have an AMS policy in the level one hospitals if we haven't undergone the training yet? The answer is no. If your hospitals haven't finished or started the trainings yet, there's no requirement yet, but we hope to finish all the trainings in a couple of months ahead, I hope. Yeah. So there are no more questions in the Q&A box and it, we're really over time already too. So um, we're going to end the workshop. Let me, uh, can you flash the certificates please? So in behalf of the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, I'd like to award the certificates of appreciation to Dr. Sibel Lara Abad and to Dr. Emily Spivak for their extensive and really excellent lectures during this Shea and Pismid workshop on antimicrobial stewardship. Thank you very, very, very much. We uh, really appreciate and we learned a lot from your lectures.
And we'd like to thank everybody who zoomed into this workshop. Thank you very much, particularly the AMS teams who uh, joined us. Uh, please uh, log in again at 1 p.m. when the uh, next session will start. So the next session is uh, on tuberculosis. Um, it's a PISMID uh, joint, PISMID philcat update on the tuberculosis clinical practice guidelines. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Spivak. Thank you, Dr. Lara Abad. And thank you, everybody.